Welcome, and today we are going to be talking about inductors. In this tutorial, it'll be a pretty basic overview of inductors. We're not going to get into anything too intense, but I want to introduce them conceptually, discuss how to treat them in DC circuits, and then also very briefly discuss how they act in AC circuits, give you a little bit of an example, but we're not going to go into depth with that. So to begin with, let's talk about the symbols and also what they look like in real life. So an inductor in real life can look wildly different. Some are these toroidal wires, spiral things. Other ones look almost exactly like a transformer or whatever. And then some look like the one I have here on my very basic circuit, and it just looks like a teal resistor. So inductors can look like a lot of different things in real life, but we always use the same schematic symbol, which is basically a line, a couple of squirrely line, squirrely circles, and then another line coming out. It kind of looks like a resistor if you squint hard enough. Um, but it doesn't act exactly like a resistor. So when you are doing DC analysis with an inductor, inductors, much like capacitors, are incredibly easy. You can treat an inductor like a short circuit. So you take the inductor out, put a wire there, and then act like it never existed. And that is so nice with DC circuits because you can just ignore them. And so if you ever come across one in a circuit, Get rid of it, put in the wire, and move on. And that's literally all you have to worry about. Now, if that were the sole case, we wouldn't use inductors. Obviously, it needs to have some sort of effect on the circuit, and that is done in the AC circuits. So in reality, the impedance of an inductor is actually dependent on the frequency. So with the capacitor, we talked about how the impedance was 1 over j omega c. Now with an inductor, it is simply the impedance equals j omega l. Notice that it's not 1 over, it's just, it's just j omega l. And if you remember, j is that imaginary um, number that we use, that we use j instead of i because we're electrical engineers. Omega is our frequency button radians per second, and that basically equals 2 pi, your frequency in hertz. And then l is simply your inductance. You can actually calculate the inductance rather quickly, just j omega l. But notice that if omega, being your frequency basically, is zero, then your impedance is zero. And if your omega is an incredibly high number, well, your impedance goes very, very high. And that is the trick with inductors. Now, as a comparison to capacitors, it's the inverse. So just as with capacitors, you treat it as an open in DC and then as a short at very, very high frequencies, with an inductor, you treat it as a short in DC and then as an open at very, very high frequencies, which is pretty interesting. So one of the things that we want to mention here is that it doesn't just increase an in impedance like you would normally consider resistive impedance as you go up in frequency. What happens is you have that imaginary factor that causes things to act a little bit odd. Um, it basically makes your power not real, uh, which we will get into the more we will get into more detail when we are doing the AC circuits, and it also causes your voltage and your current in a circuit not to line up. Now, comparison to a capacitor, with an inductor, the voltage, oh, excuse me, I'm gonna make sure I, get, I say this correctly because it's very easy to get this mixed up, the current lags the voltage. So with an inductor, the current lags the voltage. And what that means is if you have a signal and the voltage spikes, it takes a little bit of time for the current to also increase. So with the resistor, as soon as the voltage goes up, the current goes up and it just up and down and it matches perfectly. However, with an inductor, the voltage goes up and then the current is lagging behind it. It's struggling to keep up. And that is a pretty interesting thing. And it makes sense, again, because this does not conduct current at very high frequencies of voltage changes. So if you can keep that in mind, if you remember, all right, an inductor does not like to have current flow at high frequencies. That means it's the current is going to be behind the voltage. So with inductors, current lags behind the voltage. And I don't know why I still have to sit down and remember that if this is not one of those things that, oh yes, of course, inductance, the um, current lags behind the voltage. It's still not that. I'm not to that point yet. And so don't worry, maybe you should be if you're defending your 
PhD in front of a bunch of doctorate uh, people with doctorates in electrical engineering, you probably should be more confident about it. But otherwise, if you're just learning this right now, it's okay to just take that moment to think, what is going on here? And right now, if you're just studying DC circuits, this doesn't matter. But it's good to kind of familiarize yourself with this so that once we get to the AC circuits, it's not a completely new concept for you. So that's the biggest reason I'm touching on these points, because again, in DC circuits, this is incredibly simple. You can almost disregard it once you know that very, very basic rule. Now, with that being said, I like to have an idea, a kind of an analogy that makes things make more sense to me. And so I've thought about it. I feel like with capacitance, it makes more sense, like it's easier to visualize. Whereas with an inductor, it's a little bit more complicated. But the key thing to remember is that electrons have mass. And I think most of us kind of forget that sometimes. We associate it with photons. Oh yeah, it's just this particle that just flits around and doesn't really do anything. But that's not true. Electrons do have mass. One of the ways I look at how inductors just pass things along at DC yet struggle at AC is to remember that an inductor is simply a bunch of wires coiled around. So it's not a straight wire, it's a bunch of coils of wire. It's almost like you have a spiral staircase going from one point to another, and you can even make it flat. So let's even just say a spiral staircase and people are walking down the stairs. And if everybody's going in the same direction and there's somebody upstairs beating a drum, boom, 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 and everybody's step, 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 it goes smoothly and it acts like the stairs aren't even there. There's not any problems. But then as soon as you say, okay, everybody go down a step, go up a step, go down a step, go up a step, and then down, up, down, up, faster, 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 faster. You're gonna have people that aren't able to keep up and they're gonna be moving back and forth and they're gonna be jamming up and they're not going to be able to synchronize quite as well. And now that is just an analogy. Obviously, again, if you're defending your PhD and you use this analogy, good luck. I would actually be curious to hear what the response is, but that's just something that I use to kind of visualize why the electrons struggle at that higher frequency when you're changing that direction back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, versus just going straight through. So if that works for you, great. If not, sorry, uh, you can let us know. Okay, so with that, let's put our, let's turn on my oscilloscope and my waveform generator, and we'll show this in action. I have an inductor and a resistor in series. I'm going to put a, starting out with a 1000 hertz signal, across the inductor and the resistor, and I will measure the voltage across the resistor. And we'll notice that at 1000 hertz, that all of the voltage drop is over the resistor, but as we increase the frequency, then we'll have more of a voltage drop over the inductor, and we'll also see a little bit of that shift. So I'm gonna turn these on, and hopefully they aren't too loud, and um, we'll do that. So as you can see, I am measuring two things. I currently have the blue as the input, and then I have the yellow as the voltage over the resistor. So we will see what the blue is as we're giving it a signal, and then the yellow will be what we see going across that resistor as we increase the frequency. Right now we are at one volt per division, so we are seeing a peak to peak value of five volts, 4.96 as we can see down here. And uh, we are giving that a 1000 hertz signal. So let's just start bumping this up. I will first go up to 10,000 hertz and then change the scale a touch. Wrong way. Not seeing much of a difference there, but I think we're going to start seeing a big difference very soon. So now we just hit 100 hertz, excuse me, 100,000 hertz. Ah, now we're starting to see that yellow drop just a little bit and shift just a little bit. So ooh, now we're starting to see a big drop. The yellow is dropping significantly. And what that means is that now there's not as much of a voltage drop over the resistor because there's we're dropping that much voltage over the inductor itself. So right now we're at 230,000 hertz, 230 kilohertz. And let's take it up a little bit. Uh, we're at 300,000. Let me change my scale a little bit. Go four. Oh yes, now that is significantly smaller. And again, it's not just that it's smaller. Sorry, my hand's getting in the way. 
as you can see, the voltage over the resistor is significantly lower than the input voltage. And not only that, but it's off by a certain amount. And that's called the phase shift. And that phase shift is a percentage in, well, in radians. It's basically how many degrees difference in a full sine wave that difference would be. So I'm not going to make any guesses because I know I'm just going to embarrass myself. But you can calculate out what the difference is. And actually with this, I could go and measure it. Um, but also you can estimate what that will be mathematically and then see this. So if anybody ever asks you what the phase is of a signal, that is what is going on. And again, we'll get into that more with the AC circuits where this actually matters because that shift has a certain ramifications when it comes to power, reactive power, real power, and the power factor, stuff like that. Again, we don't need to worry about it right now, but this is a very important concept to learn as we get into AC circuits. And so that's it. So now we have talked about what an inductor is, what it looks like, what its schematic diagram looks like, how to treat it in a D DC circuit, how to kind of treat it in an AC circuit, not at all in depth. Again, we will get into that more with our AC analysis, but at least you conceptually know how the impedance changes as frequency changes. I gave an amazing analogy that hopefully you liked, and we showed all of this in real life. If you liked this video or found it helpful, please give it a like, subscribe to our channel, all that good stuff. Take care. We'll see you in the next one. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. Did you know that circuitbread.com also has a ton of other stuff, including free electronics and electrical engineering tools? Besides a scientific calculator, we have a few dozen other tools, including a delta Y calculator, LED resistor calculator, a binary, decimal, hexadecimal, and more converter, as well as a slew of other unit converters. Go check them out.